Yes. So we have a full agenda today. We have a, a number of speakers from the industry and all are somehow related to the Dash Industry Forum. First, we have a talk uh, from Thomas Stockhammer on the Dash Industry Forum, who we are and what we do. And then we will have a number of talks that focus on different aspects of the, what we're doing in the Dash Industry Forum. And we will end with the Q&A panel. And between each talk, I will just give a short introduction on the uh, uh, title and the presenter. But now, please go ahead, Thomas Stockhammer, the Interop Working Group Chair of the Dash Industry Forum and also a Technical Director from Qualcomm. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Pierre. I hope you can see my screen. Um, and uh, thank you for the invitation to DVB. I hope you're all safe, home and healthy. So let's start what the Dash Industry Forum is, what we do and who we are. Um, I am the Intop Working Group Chair, so I'm um, now representing Dash AF. So uh, quickly, Dash AF was founded in 2012, mostly to catalyze the adoption of MPEG Dash and help to transition the specification into a real business. What we have today, we have around 80 members and basically the members are all over the uh, crowd and place. We have content delivery networks, service providers, broadcasters, technology providers. And you find the list on the right hand side, you differentiate in different tiers from charter members, contributors and associates, associates especially for smaller companies, um, uh, research partners and so on and so on. At the same time, we serve as a point of contact for many other standards organization when they introduce best dash based uh, systems into the distribution means, but we also work with MPEG on the core dash specification. A few to name here, we work heavily with 3GP and their 5G efforts, the CTA WAVE project, DVB, uh, the SCT, um, ATSC 3.0, HPTV, W3C, just to name a few, but that's not exclusive, just to give you an idea, we are integrated in the larger ecosystem. Um, how do we operate? So what we really try to be, we're not trying to be a heavy loaded standards organization, but we try to be lean, agile, flexible, and as open as possible. And openness means that we want to share information and also to share tests and, and so on, so that people have access to our technologies um, as quickly as possible. How we work is we work with weekly or bi-weekly calls, working in working groups and active task forces. And we only have two annual face-to-face -face meeting, which is actually interesting. The whole issue about travel restrictions due to the COVID-19 situation is not impacting us so significantly because we run ahead with just our regular telcos. Uh, we develop, develop specification guidelines. We do liaison and uh, we work based on work items. And a lot of issues are moved into GitHub to basically working through GitHub issues. We publish our documents through the Dash F webpage. Um, and what we have, we have a, a phase, which is the community review phase, where we um, provide draft specification to public for commenting in order to basically iterate on the specifications to serve the industry. We have an agreement with Etsy to publish specifications, and we're going to make use of this for uh, really core specifications to use Etsy as an accredited body, such as DVB does. And a very important aspect, we commission and sponsor the development of core performance reference and test tools. On the right hand side, you see the organization. We basically run through a general meeting. We have a steering board uh, collected as a subset of these charter members. And we have two working groups, the promotion working groups, which is led by a pair. And we are well known for our social events at NAB and IBC. They're always a brewery and you always get beer. So I, I know many of you have been there. We have an academic track, which basically sponsors um, the academia to keep out to research. And that's very successful. So Ali, who is coming later, is very instrumental in this. And then we have the Intel working group that I'm leading and we operate in task forces. And the currently active ones are listed here. I'm not going through all of this, uh, but basically we come to some of those later where we have basically different task forces having developed uh, new technologies and test tools in this context. Um, so basically we look into interoperability. This is uh, an architectural a baseline architecture for a dash based distribution, uh, which is a typical ABR distribution. And you see aspects of encoding and packaging. You see the uh, 
the uh, distributions through CDNs. You see the uh, endpoints where you have an access point. Um, we very often work with a reference player platform that is aligned with the HTML5 environment um, using MSC and EME for a reference. It's not that we say that's the only uh, endpoint, but it's a, a very good reference. And we assume that um, a Dash service or a Dash application is integrated into an application and the application has basically ability to access to uh, the client through well-defined APIs. All of these interfaces uh, with different colors are supported by specifications either done by the Dash AF or relying um, in close partnership with Shiktonals. And just quickly going through this. So the one switch between the CD and the Dash client is what our core interoperability specs are. They align with MPEG Dash. Then we have uh, the reference platform has said uh, W3C technologies on uh, media source uh, extensions and the um, encrypted media extensions, as well as CTA wave specification device playback, which is uh, more stringent than playback requirements. We have the Dash JS APIs, which is not a specification at this point of time, but well-defined APIs, how an application communicate with an access client. We have a backend interface for content protection exchange information. Um, and then we have also the ingest, ingest from an ABR encoder into a packager and from a packager into an origin of a CDN. So these are the broad specs covered right now. Um, and um, you find more details obviously on our guidelines page. Uh, we also come more and more moving into CMF as the common uh, segment format. We, we are aware that Dash segments and CMF segments are basically the same, but to align with other ecosystem, CMF is now a cornerstone in our interoperability guidelines that move forward. Recently completed work uh, or ongoing partially. So we spent, we used the DVB world to publish a few specification on our web page, but we're currently working on our version five of the IUP guidelines. And one of the major themes is there really the convergence to CMF and to the MSC based playback platform, because we identify if things work on a, an MSC based playback platform, they will almost uh, certainly work on other playback platforms, Android based, for example, as well. And we also roll into this version five, all recent advances listed below. We have just uh, completed the low latency modes for uh, live streaming. Bo uh, all three, Will, Ali, and JB will speak on this and you find some news on our webpage. We have um, ad insertion. The focus is now on server-side ad insertion for now. And SEC will speak to this on the details. We just published a document for the second community review. So your input is welcome. Check the slides here and the link here. We published the live media in chest and I pointed this before just now, which basically is an interest protocol to support CMF interest into the network. Um, we have uh, Dash Play application events. So that's joint work with 3GP, MPEG and W3C. And we expect to publish this next month. We have the um, implementation guidelines and counter protection security. We have a, um, uh, a presentation by Laurent on this and then the CPICs as well. And I expect Laurent will also have a word on this one. The main work is here to align the, the Amazon Web Service Specky specification, because those two are kind of complementary, but we try to fully harmonize this. Um, I'm not spending a lot of time on this, but just on a V5, there is the new aspects are really looking into the details of, from a player perspective, integrating uh, CMF, HTML5, and so on. And a few uh, buzzwords are multi-period, multi-track, multi-experience, multi-DRM, both on-demand live, low latency live, uh, the integration of metadata and events, and new media profiles. So we'll, you will find all of this in the developing V5 specification. Um, very important to mention is we do more than just specs. And that was a theme from day one in Dash AF because specifications are done quite many. So our main mission was always that the specification of the guidelines only serve for the development of conformance and reference tools. And for this, we have basically three major cornerstones. They are broken down into some details. We have a, a Dash conformance validator and that validator allows you to basically run against your service to check if this service conforms against the Dash specification uh, with some profiles which you can identify, for example, a DVB, a Dash AF profile, or an ATSC profile. Um, we provide a significant amount of test assets 
Um, there are test vectors, and then there's a live simulator which emulates a live distribution. And we recently also commissioned to update an open source reference software to do live distribution. Those are all basically serving as test material for uh, client developers uh, in order to test different uh, variants. And then we have a reference player, which is a JavaScript based uh, implementation um, of a Dash client that basically inter um, uh, interacts with the HTML5 MSC browser platform and has well defined APIs to an HTML5 application to basically use this library. And that is production grade, so it can directly be integrated into your service, but it also serves for us as a reference to implement new tools. Um, what I said here is summarized on this slide with all the links. And a final point, obviously, is this conformance reference tools, are they perfect? No, they're surely not. And we continuously work on this to improve um, and we invite people to contribute to this open source projects and also consider sponsoring this because quite often we do this jointly like with DVB. Uh, we also have contributors from individual companies. What is really important that you all list here or what you find here is public uh, source. You can access this, you can use this, you can integrate this into your services. Having said all this, I thank you for your attention and I invite you to join us. Uh, you find details on uh, dashf.org. Thank you and I hand over to Will for the next presentation. Yes, and uh, the next presentation is from Will Law, who is Chief Architect at Akamai, but also former president at the Dash IF and one of our, well, well, our only leadership award winner so far. And uh, your talk with meeting live broadcast requirements, the latest on Dash Low Latency. Will, please go ahead. of Dash and low latency. There's been a lot of work done on this recently, so I'm representing the work of a large number of people, and in fact, Thomas Stockhammer in particular. We just started at the very beginning as in terms of why, why do we need latency within our streaming world? We're showing ranges here on the right. We've got very low latency sub-second, and on the left, uh, our legacy latency range. There's applications from voice, live auctions, gambling, and then live sports and esports. If we look at a typical uh, broadcast environment, it's spanning latency from about the three second up to the 10 second mark. In the OTT world, as we try to address the same segment, uh, we're now finding pressure from social media. Social media is driving down the latency requirements so that we can be synchronized with people commenting on the content. The traditional approach with adaptive segmented media has been to reduce the segment duration to reduce the latency. So we've moved from 10 second segments, which were a norm six years ago, down to two second segments now for many applications. However, there's a new realm of latency that we can achieve down in this region here, which I'm going to be talking about this morning, which is using chunked CMAP segments. And the segments themselves can be up to six seconds in duration, but they're giving us uh, latency in the one and a half uh, seconds and up range. And it's an interesting application space. At the cornerstone of how we achieve this latency is shifting to what's called chunked encoding. This is an old diagram that's made the rounds for many years now. I'm going to reuse it again. But imagine we have a, a traditional media segment, uh, ISO based media segment that's six seconds long. We might have a move index up at the start, a keyframe, and then six seconds of data. And only when the encoders produced the last byte of the six seconds does it release it to the CDN for distribution. At this point, a player, even consuming it instantly, is already six seconds behind live. Now, we switch to chunk-based encoding, same segment. Instead of doing a single move, it breaks up that move into uh, multiple indices. And it releases pairs, a move and an MDAT container that may be very short in nature. This MDAT might only hold one frame of content, so it might be 33 milliseconds in duration. At the end of producing this pair, MOOF and MDAT, the encoder can release that to the CDN, and the CDN can release that to the player, so that we're only a few hundred milliseconds behind live instead of six seconds. So why does this actually reduce latency? So let's look at a hypothetical situation. We've got a live encoder producing four second segments. We're observing it now in the middle of the fifth segment and we want to start playback. So as if you follow say an HLS based approach, you're getting three fully formed segments in your buffer. 
You could do so by getting segments two, three, and four. It would give you 14 seconds of latency when you started. Now you could be smart and say, I'm gonna sacrifice my buffer and gain latency. I could start with the last fully formed segment number four. That'll reduce my latency to six seconds. But that's as low as I can go with the non-chunked approach. Now, if we imagine these same segments are in fact chunked uh, into one second chunks, so not very small chunks in this case, but just to illustrate the point. So at this, I still have to start with a chunk holding a keyframe. So I could start with my nearest keyframe chunk, which would be 5A, but I could now reduce my latency to two seconds. And in fact, I can reduce it even further. Um, I can decode forward into that chunk uh, when I get it and to reduce my latency to less than one second. I could also make a well-timed request for the chunk that's 6A coming out. So I could trade off, I could have a little bit of increased startup time, but again, reduce my latency to one second. So we've gone from 14 seconds and six seconds down to two second or one second by using this chunk-based uh, approach of encoding. This is an old, again, animation. If this point's not clear enough, if we look at, uh, we're trying to get water from the faucet down to the monkey in the bottom, and typically an encoder will fill up its entire bucket. The bucket here representing uh, the latency of the filling up the media segment gives it to the CDN, CDN gives it to the player buffer, and then that finally gives it to the decoder, which is the monkey. That's the non-chunked encoding and transfer approach. If our analog here, if we switch to chunked encoding, is a series of buckets with holes in them. So we have very little queuing delay in between transmitting the content from the encoder to the CDN, to the player buffer, and down to the decoder. Now, there are a number of issues that have to be solved with this. One of this is the bandwidth estimation problem. So typically with adaptive segmented media, the player will time how long the segments take to be transferred from the CDN. And the more throughput you have, the faster the segments come. But if I look at this data on the left here, this shows segment transfer times, it's a six second segment, for a client that has three megabits of throughput to the CDN edge. Here are the transfer times for a client with 50 megs of throughput. And you can notice that the transfer time is almost identical. That's because with chunked transfer encoding, which is how we're sending these media segments, the CDN can only send them as fast as the encoder is making them, which is one second per second. So even though more throughput's available, it can't send them any faster. And therefore a player that's relying upon the, the linear relationship between throughput and uh, bandwidth estimation is going to suffer. Ali Begin has a presentation uh, later in this webinar that will address this particular problem, but it has been one of the problems that need to be overcome as we switch to this type of streaming. A second interesting one is the notion of catch up and rate adjustment. So typically with live streaming, when a, when a player, a live player starts, it has only one opportunity to adjust its latency, and that's right at the beginning. After that, it's stuck because it's decoding the content at the same rate that the encoder is producing it. However, this, what I said is true as long as the player doesn't alter its playback rate, but if it can adjust its playback rate very slightly, then it can pull itself closer to live or retard itself and pull itself back from live in, in a live stream without interrupting the user experience. We see a player here, it wanted a target latency of three seconds. It started higher, it was able to accelerate its playback, pull itself to three seconds. Then it suffered a buffer interruption. And again, without having to seek forward, it was able to accelerate its playback for a brief period and pull forward. And this is a new type of player behavior that is a good, when, when combined with um, the chunk encoding, the chunk transfer, it produces a more seamless user experience than we might have had in the past. There is an additional benefit with this. If you take an external time source with some catch-up behavior and also a common latency target, the result is synchronization. So today we have a lot of variation. Different people and different players, because of the difference in the player buffers, will see a live event at a different time. And there's many anecdotes of how you're here cheering with your neighbors at a different point. But in practice, it's very simple now by, com by combining this uh, catch-up behavior with the time source to synchronize. Here we see three dissimilar, entirely separate players, one on a smart TV, one on laptops, and on a tablet. And they're actually playing back within 60 frames of each other. But this is, they're all doing it blindly. Each has purely got its head down trying to achieve a certain latency target, and it ends up that they're synchronized between them. So cheap and efficient synchronization is another added benefit. 
Dashif has been hard at work for the last year working on guidelines for low latency. They are now available on our website. You can go to the URL up here. This has been work carrying on since 2017. It is joint work with MPEG, uh, Dashif, and DVB. It has been close collaboration with DVB so that we don't define uh, alternate version of low latency. We focus a lot on CMAF chunks, HTTP transfer. Um, the document is technically frozen right now. We're still working on it. There's always work. Uh, Dash is coming out with new behaviors that I'm going to go into. We're updating our conformance and reference tools and iterating towards a tight technical solution. There is a lot of content. It might uh, give you a headache when you see how much there is inside the guidelines, but it covers all the bullet points that I have on the slide. I'm not gonna re uh, read through them all for you, but a wealth of technical information. I don't have time to go through it all on this presentation uh, today, but it is reasonably comprehensive. I wanna focus on some high level items. Within a dash low latency stream, there's two operational modes. You can have a simple live offering where you simply use at duration signaling along with dollar number. This is how most dash live streams are operating today. There's also main live, which allows you to use segment timeline and either dollar number or dollar time addressing. And you may want to do this for ad insertion or other timing sensitive applications. Um, what's new is at least a service description element that tells the player um, what the target latency is, what the max latency is, and also if it's allowed to adjust its playback speed, and if so, by how much. There's also additional UTC timing elements along with producer reference time boxes so that we can accurately estimate our true latency. You can do low latency in two ways. You can use non-chunked segments, basically very short ones, uh, or you can use the chunked based segments that I've been talking about in this webinar so far. A new feature, and I feel that since the title of this is what's new with low latency, this is coming out in Dash. It's pretty interesting, and I think it portends a whole new realm of lower late, stable low latency behavior. So recent elements are defined in the fourth edition of MPEG Dash, the, the very latest one available right now. Their purpose is to define the location of intermediate resync points within a media segment. So what does that mean? Here I have an example of a four second segment and it's, it's composed of two, two second gops concatenated together. So at the fifth uh, chunk here essentially, there's actually an IDR. We could switch into this segment at this point. However, all a traditional CMAF segment guarantees us is that there is an IDR at the start of the segment. We know nothing, we have no visibility into the interior of this segment. So if I was a decoder, or a player and I was at chunk number four here and I was running out of bandwidth and needed to switch. Uh, without resync points, I have to either wait to the next segment one by which time I probably run out of buffer or go back, reload it previous segment and seek forward. However, there's a way to communicate now that there is this IDR at point five and in fact, I could have a much faster switch down. So the benefits are faster random access uh, while maintaining my low latency, a quick resynchronization um, if my buffer runs out, so basically that's jumping into a stream or, or seeking into it and switching down very quickly uh, in the case of my buffers draining and my throughput has dropped. So how do you find them? Well, there's two ways. The first is the, in, the packager can create a binary map of the resync points that are available. Now, this, the resync point has to be created and the map has to be distributed and the player can read it in order to know where they are. So that doesn't work well for live, but it works very well uh, for VOD applications. However, in live, we can signal them in the manifest and then the player has to do a little bit of work to extract them, but we can make it easy for the player by giving it some hints. So here's a resync example number one. Here's a new resync element within our dash manifest. And this example just shows you how the player can combine the information in the resync element with other attributes that are already present in the manifest to extract some information. So this is a type uh, zero resync point. It's not promising any specific random access capabilities. However, it does say this is a CMAP chunk, which is a well-known uh, object. We also know the max chunk duration is half a second in this case. We know the minimum distance in bytes and the max distance in bytes between the points. This allows the player to do a byte range request for this object. Doesn't need to pull the entire object from the CDN, can pull just the part it needs, and then it's going to parse the segment to find uh, the start of the CMF chunk. 
A second example, resync element again, this time it's type two, which is advertising that yes, this is a chunk that you can use for fast access or fast switching. This would match the chunk type that I showed in my previous example. Again, we know the maximum time delta between where these chunks are available and also the min and max byte, byte ranges. So we can do a byte range a request. And we've also got a marker equals true attribute, which tells us we can use a box, an ISO box pulsing algorithm to quickly uh, locate this resync point and then drop it into the uh, decode buffer, sorry, into the buffer of our decoder. So resync elements, they are not widely deployed in Dash players today. We're going to uh, get the Dash.js reference player to use these uh, quickly. So DVB Dash, uh, you've, you're obviously all DVB members, so you've been following what DVB has published. Uh, I'm just promoting it here. It's, it's the DVB Dash with low latency update uh, to the DVB spec. It is well aligned with the work being done within, within Dash IF. There are only some small differences. DVB Dash doesn't mention the resync elements because it, it was authored prior to their publication. However, the presence of the element is not going to break any DVB Dash client. Additionally, DVB Dash has a central or supplemental property descriptors um, that convey DVB Dash compliance. And again, if you use the supplemental property descriptor, then you could play the DVB Dash stream on any regular low latency Dash client. They would just ignore the information, uh, additional information that's being communicated there. So we have tight coherence then between what Dash IF is specifying and what DVB is specifying for low latency Dash. This happy group of people, some of whom are even on the call today, are the Dash.js open source crowd. So this is a player that's open that you can use to play Dash, and in this case, Dash low latency. Dash.js client is written in JavaScript. It uses MSE EME, and it's a seven-year-old project at the state. So it's amazing how long MSE has, has been around. Um, it's an active project. It has new APIs to support low latency playback, uh, setting latency, set live delay, catch up rate, all the attributes that you saw in the manifest previously can now be communicated along with the minimum drift, which is the variance you're allowed uh, to drift from your target latency before any sort of catch up rate uh, kicks in. Now, I wanted to show you a live example, but I've prepared a tiny URL up here. This is a live stream that you can go to right now in a browser. Chrome, Firefox, Safari uh, should all support it. And it will show you a live low latency stream. This is being encoded by FFmpeg. JB is going to go into more updates later in the webinar about all the advances FFmpeg have done behind that. Coming through the Akamai CDN, you can consume this globally and play back in the open source dash.js player. Target late end to end latency here is three seconds. There's time code embedded in the stream. You can compare it to your uh, time code uh, locally and see what the latency is and also which graphing out the stability uh, of the stream here. So feel free to access this address and uh, view the stream for yourself. We don't have any uh, time for questions today. So that's the end of my presentation and I'm going to hand back to Pear at this point. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Will. Uh, very good uh, presentation. And we will take questions after all the presentations. And our next speaker is Zachary Kava from Hulu, who is a video platform architect. And he will talk about ad insertion in live content, pre, mid, and post rolling. So please, Zachary, go ahead. Thanks. Thank you, Pear. And uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, it's uh, good to be here. I'm going to be talking about ad insertion live contact, content in particular with respect to how that relates to the Dash IF's uh, recent work on um, detailing ad insertion uh, in Dash. Um, now, ad insertion is a, a, an important and complex topic for uh, the video streaming community. It, it's a primary source of uh, online revenue for us, and uh, it's a direct part of our product experience, which means it's directly influencing the consumer's perception of our uh, entire product. And the complexity of ad insertion comes from our desire to increase relevance of advertisements to drive up that you know, perception of the product experience and uh, the measurement and reporting requirements that we have to uphold in order to count uh, impressions towards that revenue producing goal. Um, and because of these, uh, 
importances and complexities, we get a lot of questions at the Dash IF around how to best enable ad insertion in a Dash scenario. And while the IOP guidelines had existing details on MPD authoring, the ad insertion task force took up the work to deeply detail um, ad insertion via Dash uh, in keeping with our mission to make ad insertion easy in Dash. Uh, and as part of this, we defined a number of uh, relevant use cases that we felt the industry uh, was uh, aligning on, uh, such as video on demand, uh, insertion in video on demand, insertion in a live event that has in, uh, in stream opportunities, replacement or removal in a pre-reported uh, video, uh, or simple things like adding a unique pre-roll uh, before live or and the, the real big interop complexity piece of transitioning between main content and ads. Um, to solve the different, these different use cases, uh, we looked at two different ad insertion uh, architectures, server-side ad insertion. This is where advertisements are provided to the user's um, uh, streams prior to the ad stream reaching the client. And then uh, a, a new type of uh, ad, ad insertion architecture called server-guided ad insertion where the advertisements are resolved on demand via the stream uh, mechanisms uh, to, keep, to increase the overall relevance of the advertisement pieces. Um, as part of this, we went through and detailed the carriage and tracking of advertisement data, the, the ins and outs of how this can be done via Dash. Uh, and we've produced a, a set, another community review of this, uh, and you can find it at this link here. Now, this is a very big, broad topic to cover. And so we actually wanted to focus in first, and we focused on what we know a lot of people are using today, which is server-side ad insertion. Um, and we wanted to focus on one use case, and that was, or two use cases, sorry, uh, with, and those were uh, uh, inserting ads uh, in a live stream, which already has in-stream opportunities, which is uh, effective to replacing those, and then the complexities of transitioning between main content and ads on a client uh, that are introduced when you're trying to mix assets. Um, now, uh, to go through this, uh, we, went and actually generated a very significant architecture um, that details the different components part of a full ad insertion system. So not focusing just on the communication mechanism to the client, but also all of the preparation and manipulation and communication that happens as part of the ad um, serving ecosystem. And so I want to highlight uh, all the interfaces that were detailed. And again, all of this is available in the CR. Please feel free to go and read that. Um, but then I want to dive into a couple of specific interfaces and interrupt points that we've specified that really we believe make um, are make an important difference in whether or not that the way you're doing ad insertion is going to be um, easy or, or difficult. Um, and so starting starting from the very beginning of a uh, of a live stream source, uh, we have our contribution. You have a contribution link, which is giving you this, your mezzanine video and audio that's being fed into an AVR encoder. Uh, which is going to be producing uh, well-formed CMAF content uh, out, out to the Dash Packager. And the Dash Packager is going to use this uh, well-formed CMAF content uh, as well as any ad opportunity information that was coming in the original contribution um, to go ahead and uh, prepare that content for ad insertion. The preparation is two, two pieces. Uh, one piece is the actual uh, MPD and segments of the main content that represent the presentation. And then the other piece is the ad avail information, which provides details around how long an opportun opportunity exists and where the opportunity exists in the stream. The prepared content is then consumed by an ad insertion uh, MPD manipulator or an ad proxy. And that is the mechanism that communicates with an ad, uh, ad decisioning and exchange service uh, that will take parameters for decisioning, internally performed decisioning, and we've gone through and specified some of the requirements on these different interfaces internally. Uh, but from there, we'll go ahead and provide well-formed ad, ad, ad insertion content uh, that the MPD manipulator can go ahead and combine with the original content to produce uh, a interleaved stream of content and advertisements. 
uh, and these, this stream is communicated again with uh, a dash uh, down to the clients and the additional ad metadata that's associated with advertisements uh, uh, is carried along with it. Dash clients receive uh, this content and go ahead and play it on a, a common reference playback platform. Here we've uh, tried, to, you know, tried to align to our, our peers organizations in the industry uh, of CTA WAVE. Uh, which detail out the MSE, EME, NRL uh, points. And so the, the expectation is the Dash client is being built on these uh, interfaces and, be, and going through and playing out um, the uh, interleaved content and ad stream. In addition to the actual playout, we have uh, the detailing on ad tracking and how the ad tracking can be done uh, as part of a simple surfacing of uh, events from the, the stream. Now I want to go through and highlight a few important pieces here, but before I do, uh, the the all I've highlighted on every interface here except for one, and that would be IF7. IF7 is actually part of uh, what we consider the server guided ad insertion, and this is where instead of the MPD proxy re replacing the ads before they the, they reach the client, it's actually annotating the stream with enough information such that the client can come back to the proxy. Uh, when it needs those uh, that ad replacement to occur, and the ad, the ad proxy can provide it then with the, the appropriate information. And we're, we're going to get into more details on that in a later draft, um, but I wanted to call out uh, explicitly that there was an additional interface we're not talking to, to directly right now. Now back on the, the server side ad insertion approach, um, one of the, the foundational issues for us was content splice conditioning. Uh, and we found that this conditioning drives a lot of the complexity and experience of ad insertion. Um, conditioning is what will make it easy for players to transition between content and ads and make it easy for MPD proxies and manipulators to um, splice and insert ads, or it will make it difficult. Um, and so we've, we've identified three typical options for this, splice condition packaging, which means a CMF fragment boundary is created at every splice point uh, by the encoder. Uh, splice conditioned encoding, when in this case, uh, it's, uh, it's the secondary option here. There is a appropriate SAP type one or type two uh, created at the splice point, but the CMF fragment is not directly broken. And then for completion, sake, we've called out an option three where there is no specific splice point um, encoding or packaging done at, uh, at, at, the, at the splice point time. And instead, it's just a signal of the splice point occurring. And after working through our architectures, we've come across the recommendation that splice condition packaging is the um, best approach uh, to simplify the downstream components of ad insertion. Namely, this actually allows the MPD manipulator to remain, um, uh, remain separated from the actual segments uh, because all the information it needs uh, to perform insertion can be described purely within the, the MPD. And on the player side, this allows for a much broader set of players to perform seamless playback experiences. Now that's not to say, uh, players cannot do seamless playback experiences with the options two or three. It's just that the player has additional requirements placed on it when there is uh, a need to either fast decode or cut out decoding in the middle of a segment, rather uh, middle of a fragment rather than at the fragment boundary. Moving on down the line, we've got uh, the prepared content and ad avails. And for our prepared content, we of course recommend multi-period dash uh, with the period boundaries uh, inserted at each of the splice points. The MPD manipulator can then do period level replacements directly uh, at the MPD uh, without looking you know, again at the segments. Um, and to further detail this, of course, we don't have enough time to talk through all the information here, but we've specified a dash IF uh, main live content profile uh, that has the best uh, best definition of mapping that CMAF content into, dash, into a dash MPD and into a, in more specifically into a multi-period dash MPD. Um, 
as part of the presentation, of course, we have opportunity added data, which signals our add avails. Uh, we've defined what you need out of opportunity metadata. In particular, you need a presentation time of the splice point that starts the opportunity. And you need one of two other things. You need the guaranteed accurate duration so that the proxy can go ahead and uh, perform the right removal. Or you need kind of a, a, a estimate of how long that will occur, how long the opportunity will be with an ex exact identifier for an event that will later determine the real duration. And a, a key example of this is SCUDI 35, which has a, a splice start indication, which can then have an arbitrary duration, even though it has a signal duration, where the real duration is, is the duration between the splice end and the splice start. Uh, and our recommendation is, again, trying to keep with the theme of simplicity of the MPD proxy, where MPD events for opportunity metadata, MPD events are used for opportunity metadata to keep everything in that MPD. Um, for add metadata and tracking, uh, we looked at two primary carriage mechanisms, dash MPD events and dash in-band message events. Both of these are great for, for using uh, data present, uh, aligning the data with the presentation time of the media. Uh, and when that when it comes to ad insertion and tracking events, that's a really important topic because it allows you to simplify the client application without uh, by having all of the information sourced in time directly with the content. Uh, we've also talked about mo mechanisms for providing the tracking. There's direct measurement uh, with uh, dash callback events, and this is just where the client will send the event directly. Or if you need to do additional processing or you need to integrate with third party uh, uh, SDKs, we align with our Dash IF uh, eventing guidelines to which commonly surface both of these carriage types uh, such that the client application can do anything it needs to with the, the actual event data. Uh, and keeping with our theme of simple MPD events are what we go ahead and recommend again uh, to provide that ad metadata information. And this gets to the point of um, avoiding ad segment modification. Um, we really looked at avoiding segment modification as much as we could through this whole workflow because it allowed for a much, um, um, much more differentiated um, architecture to be built out in in systems, in particular, allowing the MPD and the segments to flow through different pathways um, in, a, in a disconnected fashion is actually a very um, key aspect to scale. Um, now, that's that was highlighting just a few key points. I, again, we've we've got a lot in this document, and I, I highly encourage folks to take a look and provide us feedback and questions. Um, Dash is a a format that makes ad insertion a first class feature and we want to really make sure that it's easy to present that at the in the dash IF tab we are trying to define um, and simplify the workflows uh, but keep the highest quality possible um, the advanced ad insertion and in dash document is available again for community review feedback and comments welcome please take a look um, and this is only the first step we're still going to go through and can the detail additional use cases. We're also going to go through and come up, uh, study new mechanisms for the server guided ad insertion. Um, and of course, we need help with this. So please uh, feel free to come and join us uh, to do this. And um, thank you. Thank you, Zachary. That was a great presentation. Uh, the questions and answers you can type in the Q&A box and we take them afterwards. And our next presenter is Ale Begin from Comcast. He's a technical consultant and he's also a computer science professor. And in Dash IF, he is also working with our academic track. So uh, organizing uh, summer schools and other things for the academia. And now, please go ahead talking, uh, um, Ali, on your presentation on bandwidth prediction for multi bitrate streaming at low latency. Okay, thank you, Per. Uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning. So uh, I will be presenting a, an idea that we developed uh, during late 2018 and early 2019. Uh, as soon as the first uh, low latency services came alive, uh, we realized that the bandwidth prediction uh, was in the, actually 
is, was a problem. So uh, we tried to find a solution. And then uh, this is what I'm going to talk about today. So bandwidth measurement is quite tricky. Um, it is, uh, you know, it, it sounds easy, but it's not. Uh, this is just a plot from uh, live Twitch data. Uh, so one is uh, streaming game uh, content in low latency. And this is something we collected uh, more than a year ago. As you can see, uh, while we were collecting this data, we applied arbitrarily bandwidth caps uh, into the client. So, you know, we wanted really to see how the client behaved uh, uh, in the face of these bandwidth changes. So what happened was really, uh, uh, you know, it was quite surprising. The client was not really doing any sort of rate adaptation and it was just trying to stick uh, with a, a bitrate about 2.5 uh, uh, megabit per second. And then even if we had more bandwidth, it wouldn't upshift. Even if we had lower bandwidth, you know, it would just stall. So the rate adaptation was very uh, poorly designed. But this wasn't really just a Twitch's uh, problem. More or less, everybody had the same problem. Now, uh, many uh, providers, uh, as we have observed during that time frame, uh, as soon as they realized that the things weren't really working uh, or functioning properly, they decided to use a single bitrate uh, uh, encoding rather than offering multiple bitrates, which obviously defeats the purpose of ABR. Since they didn't know how to do the rate adaptation, they just eliminated the problem uh, in the first place. But this was really an interesting problem for us and we started looking into this. This is a joint work uh, between myself and Christian Timber from uh, Clyde Humphrey University and uh, Roger Zimmerman and uh, Abdul, Abdul Haq Bentaleb from National University of Singapore. So what's happening here is, um, uh, suppose that we have a live game and uh, the time starts at zero and then there's a uh, segment duration over the time, uh, 1D, 2D, 3D. And then I have a number of uh, uh, segments over here, green, orange, uh, red, and purple. So a regular client, which I am showing in the middle, uh, it will ask for the uh, MPD, right? The manifest uh, when it joins the uh, session. And then it will realize that if it is not supporting low latency, the extensions we defined uh, so far for impact dash, it is gonna ask only for the uh, green one, although the orange uh, segment is currently being generated. So it will ask for a uh, segment one, and then it will get the full segment in one shot. So this is a single HTTP request, a single HTTP response, and the time you sent uh, the request and the time you finished the download, that's your segment download time. And what often uh, most of the clients do is that they divide the size of the segments by the segment download time to pre you know, measure the available bandwidth in the network. And then after a while, you download the subsequent segments. And uh, this formula, segment size divided over uh, by the segment download time works uh, mostly fine for this non-low latency client. But if you have a low latency client, in which case you will be asking for a, um, a orange uh, segment instead of green one because you want to minimize your latency, you will send a request, still a single request for segment two, and then you will receive what's available on the server side as a burst. You know, the chunks will be just uh, uh, received back-to-back, uh, -back, so it will be multiple chunks. And then uh, as soon as the chunks are finished on the server, since uh, you know, these are generated in real time, you need to wait a certain amount of time before they can be prepared, packaged, and then sent to you. So after a while, uh, the burst, uh, you will get the individual chunks uh, one by one. And then later, once this segment is completed, you will uh, do the same for the next segment, and it will continue like this. Now, if you apply the same formula as the previous one, where you start the timer when you send the request, and then you stop the timer when you download the segment, as you can see, the segment download time is going to be a fairly large duration. And uh, often this is uh, more or less equal to the segment uh, duration. And in which case, uh, segment size divided by segment duration is equal to your encoding bitrate. So regardless of how much bandwidth you have, you would more or less uh, measure something uh, close to the encoding bitrate. This really doesn't allow the ABR client to upshift uh, in case there's enough, you know, more than enough available bandwidth. Now, how do we do, solve this problem? Well, to make a proper rate adaptation, you need to predict the bandwidth accurately. 
And to predict the bandwidth accurately, your measurements need to be correct. If you start with the wrong uh, measurement, eventually you will uh, do inaccurate, inaccurate uh, prediction, and then this will uh, make you suffer in rate adaptation. You will either stall or you will underutilize your available bandwidth, and it's not going to work. So the work uh, we call as ABR for chunk transfer encoding, ACTA, this is published last year in June, ACM most of uh, workshop. And uh, if you just uh, search for DOE uh, number, you will get the paper. And then, uh, you know, it explains everything behind this uh, idea. We have a bandwidth measurement component, which is basically a sliding window based moving average method. So we measure the bandwidth, but then we do take an average over the last two several samples. And then the bandwidth prediction, which is uh, really important because most ABR players today, they don't do any bandwidth prediction. They just go with the latest measurement. But in this case, uh, we actually have a dedicated bandwidth prediction module implemented in Dash.js. And this is using an adaptive filter approach, uh, which is uh, performing uh, pretty well. And then once we have a good uh, value for the predicted bandwidth, we can obviously do a rate adaptation and uh, you know, hopefully improve our quality of experience. After this paper, we published, uh, actually we prepared another paper, which has been accepted and going to be published uh, very soon, ACM transactions on uh, multimedia. So uh, this will go into further details of this algorithm. I can send a copy uh, of that paper if you want to. So how do we do bandwidth measurement? How do we actually identify what our measurement uh, value should be? So this is my media timeline, and assume that I am currently, uh, uh, you know, uh, downloading a segment, and uh, there are multiple chunks here: chunk four, five, six, and seven. So some of them are going to be close to each other, some of them are going to be further from each other, depending on whether the transmission is source limited or network limited. The idea over here is we really want to measure the bandwidth where the transmission is network limited not really source limited, because if it is source limited, you will never be able to upshift in your ABR algorithm. So we have the, uh, let's say, hypothetically speaking, we have the start times and end times for each uh, chunk, right? And then we also know the chunk size uh, from the received data, and the chunk end time is uh, uh, available from the HTTP fetch API. But the problem is the B values are not available. So our uh, tool tries to predict the value of the B and then if, uh, you know, if it figures out that there is uh, you know, more than enough uh, space between two chunks, you know, those chunks will be disregarded uh, in bandwidth measurement. If they are close to each other, uh, you know, close enough, they will be included in the bandwidth measurement. So in this case, chunk four and chunk five are used for bandwidth calculation, but chunk six and seven are not used for uh, uh, bandwidth measurement. So here is the algorithm you can uh, look into in more detail. So again, idle time is negligible. That's network limited transmission. You include the uh, chunk. If it is not, you just discard it, okay? And now what we do eventually is uh, we have bandwidth measurement values and uh, we use the last three band bandwidth measurements and then we apply a adaptive filter on top of them and then we predict the bandwidth. And then based on that, we do rate adaptation. So once you have a good value for the bandwidth, uh, uh, you know, predicted bandwidth, you can do your fancy rate adaptation algorithm if you want to. There are uh, several results at the end of the slide deck, which I'm not gonna share now for the sake of the time. Just for your information, uh, this is a hot topic, obviously, which is one of the companies uh, working on this as well. Uh, they are organizing a grand challenge, like a competition, and uh, this is going to be um, uh, taking place in ACI Multimedia Systems Conference in June. And, uh, you know, there will be hopefully the several submissions, which is due, uh, which are due this Friday. But hopefully, if you are interested in this topic, please look at this tiny URL. And, uh, you know, in June, uh, they will be presented online uh, because we will be holding the uh, conference uh, virtually. All right. Thank you so much. This is the end of the presentation. Thanks, Ali. Great presentation. So our next speaker will be uh, Jean-Baptiste Kempf, uh, president of Vidulan, and he is going to give a, a presentation about implementing Dash low latency in FFmpeg. So please go ahead, Jean-Baptiste. Um, hello. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot present because I'm in a remote place in South of France, so someone else is going to 
goes through the slide for me. Um, please go to the next slide. So my, I'm the president of the VideoLand nonprofit. Uh, I'm, I've been developing VLC X264 and other multimedia libraries for the last 15 years now. Um, and um, as some of you don't probably don't know, there is a very important uh, open source community on multimedia around VideoLand, which is doing VLC X264 David, but also on FFmpeg, and there are a few others like the XIF on GStreamer um, community. And um, those are truly open source projects, meaning that they are done by volunteers on their free time. And most of those people don't work, uh, are not paid to do this work. Um, one of the main reasons is because of patents um, that don't deal very well with open source. So most of the people who are working on FFmpeg and VLC are doing that on their free time. Next slide. So what is FFmpeg? Um, FFmpeg is the Swiss knife of multimedia. It does everything related to multimedia processing. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people are using it all the time, even when they don't know. Um, there are two parts of FFmpeg. One is basically the libraries that are building blocks for other software, and basically the programs, which are mostly um, for encoding and streaming. The features you have on FFmpeg could take hours to describe, but everything related to decode, encode, transcode uh, are supported inside FFmpeg, but also everything DMARC, SMARC, and of course, everything related to device input, like DVB input um, and DVB output, and everything related to streaming in and out are supported by the FFmpeg libraries and the FFmpeg program. There are millions of filters uh, who can go uh, who can also do scaling and chroma conversion. And FFmpeg works on every platform from embedded devices to Windows 10, uh, Mac OS, and so many others. Uh, FFmpeg is used literally everywhere from VLC, inside Chrome, inside Firefox, in all Linux distribution, but also on so many uh, professional multimedia pipelines. And de facto, FFmpeg is becoming the standard for everything related to OTT and cloud encoding. One of the reasons is that it's the best way to interact with X264, which is the video line encoder, which is one of the best encoders, but also to interact with libvpx and other open source libraries. And now we, you're seeing a lot of non-open source libraries plug in who are using and are based on FFmpeg. And you're seeing a lot of cloud vendors and, and, and MAM who are just rewrapping FFmpeg and managing uh, FFmpeg-based workflows. Um, in the last two or three years, um, we've spent quite a bit of time on adaptive. Uh, of course, it started with the HLS input and output, which was very uh, poor and then got a bit better. But last in the last year, mostly everything related to Dash. Um, the problem is that most of that was probably non-compliant. Um, because as I said, most people are doing that on their free time and compliance is not really something that is fun. So that's why we arrived to the FFmpeg and Dash low latency project. And of course, as I said, the biggest worry of that project was to be compliant. And the project was not just being compliant Dash low latency, but also on Dash. Um, some of the stuff we've been doing was like fixing MP4 and CMAF generation inside FFmpeg. Um, we had to do numerous changing to support correctly the IVCC box and also the product, producer reference time box. Um, we added an important uh, new options uh, that I'm going to detail after uh, about segment duration uh, and about uh, fragment duration and check durations. Uh, we've added new profiles that were not uh, possible uh, before uh, in a FMPEG and new elements like latency, resync, or trick mode. Um, the project was to show a full uh, server to client uh, playback uh, experience um, directly just with FFmpeg and with nothing else. Um, we've developed a very simple Node.js origin server that works with Apache that you can find uh, on GitLab and also the same uh, with Python, which is basically a very simple Python server for Nginx, which is basically able to take the output of FFmpeg and push it in the uh, conformant uh, dash low latency uh, format. The clients where we tested was of course dash GS that uh, we'll talk about uh, before, 
but we spend quite a bit of time to, to make sure that it works also on Windows, iOS, and Android platforms uh, based on VLC and the libvlc player SDK, which is used by lots of applications. Um, you can see all the codes on the FF Labs GitLab. So the options that we added are like the main eight ones are uh, related to dash and dash low latency. The five first ones are segment duration, fragment duration, fragment type, MPD profile, and HTTP options. And all of them are, have been developed during this project, but are also now available for everything dash and not just low latency. And then we had, of course, new low latency options uh, for latency for the producer box, and then just to um, activate the low latency dash. So, of course, uh, we arrive at the part where that everyone hates is that the FFmpeg command line is absolutely horrible to read. Um, it's very useful, uh, but as most of the time uh, FFmpeg is basically a graph, it's very difficult to, to show on a command line. Um, and that's the same, of course, for GStreamer and VLC, but FFmpeg is one of the, um, <laughs> of the one that people don't like. We, we're doing our best to improve that. And there is a, a very extensive documentation and example on the FMPEG website. And I'm just going to explain on the next slide what we are doing exactly. So you got the usual normal things uh, from FMPEG. Uh, about you, you specify your input, your frame rate, your color primaries, your color space, and um, in this case, uh, some uh, HTTP uh, TLS uh, options. Then there is everything related to Dash. And uh, as you can see here, the first is basically defining the different uh, uh, adaptation and, and different resolution, different codecs, different bit rates for video, and then the same for audio. And then we map that, those outputs to the input. Then of course, we need to, with the F Dash, say that we are going to stream in Dash um, and basically give the URLs. The other, uh, the use timeline and UTC are nice to have, but not mandatory to create a dash profile. Now we move to the dash low latency, uh, um, which are new options. Um, so of course we must force the CMAF mode. Um, we can define uh, the adaptation sets with different fragment durations, as you can see, and then we can basically uh, export and write the producer um, box define that we are streaming because it's, that's a live demo. Um, define that we are in low latency mode, that you want the less latency possible, which is a minus tune uh, flag. And then we define the target latency we want, which is 3.5 seconds. And with that, you have something that basically just works and that uh, will show that plays everything in um, JavaScript uh, player or in VLC. Everything is, of course, documented on the FFmpeg website. Uh, I'm not listing all the options for Dash because there is now 45 of them, but they are all documented and quite easy to, to use. Um, everything is now merged inside the FFmpeg master, so it's not a fork. Uh, what you have on the GitLab is mostly the reference uh, servers, uh, the one in Node.js and the one in Python. And if you have any question, you can go to the mailing list, IRC, or just check the code. Um, I have several demos, and one of the cool ones is a multi codec demo uh, where basically the lowest resolution are streaming AV1 and the higher resolution are, are streaming VP9. And then uh, on the client side, um, you can move from AV1 to VP9 depending on the resolution um, if you're able. We have also another demo that works, which is H264 and AV1 uh, mixed together. Um, this works currently in VLC, it doesn't work on the web player, but it will uh, work soon. And thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask now uh, or mostly send me an email. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jean-Baptiste. And uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, that you want to answer right now, please type them in the Q&A box and we will take them after the sessions. Next, we will have the last speaker of today, that is Laurent Perron from Nagra, Principal Solution Architect, and he will talk about managing multi-DRM with Dash. Please go ahead, Laurent. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Okay, so let's go. Um, the first thing is, um, in, uh, 
in Dash, there is one thing which is important is the for the DRM is a content protection. So the main uh, specification in this case is not Dash, it's MPEG gank, so command encryption, which um, in the first phases was defining, uh, even if it's called command encryption, it, was defined, it still defines four encryption modes. So you have at the end of the day that uh, your content, which is in the clear, can be protected and encrypted with different modes, and that was the case. Depending on the device where you you were targeting, you were not encrypting the same way. So from one clear content, you are going to different encryption, encrypted versions, and that was uh, depending on more or less uh, the DRM you were using. So hopefully now we have a conversion. The convergence is going to the CBCS protection mode. So that's one thing where we would we could say, so why are we talking of multi-DRM if we still have um, only one encryption mode? So it's, the main difference is uh, the encryption of the content is about content authoring. But the multi-DRM is still needed because the DRM is not only about protecting content. It's also about ensuring the platform is secure. So you have to have to embed your DRM on the device itself and following what is some robustness rules, compliance rules. Every DRM is defining this one. And this uh, compliance and robustness rule, the best one for uh, like just applying them is the device manufacturer. So the device manufacturer is going to embed one DRM, maybe two, but not all of them, and is deciding which one is going to embed. So at the end of the day, you have a huge, large ecosystem of devices, each one with different DRMs. The reason why there is one DRM or the other in a device, well, it can be the easy one. On Apple devices, you're going to find an Apple DRM, fair play. On uh, Google devices, you will find Widevine, which is Widevine DRM. Play ready, you will find it on the Microsoft DRM. But on TVs, for example, you can find two of them, but not all of them, definitely. So the question then is, why using this DRM and uh, not only one, and you could put your own? It's then coming back to the content owner requirement. They're asking for a tight integration of the DRM with the platform. They want something that can be as robust as possible. These platforms are coming with secure media paths, with trusted execution environments, and they want them to be used for some content. So these this requirements, more or less, it means that you have to use the device manufacturer choice. And that's why at the end of the day, even if we have a convergence to one encryption mode, so you may have, you will end up um, one, two years from now with one encrypted content, you will still have multi-DRM to manage. So multi-DRM is there and it will remain there because of the use of multi-DRM for really protecting the platform and providing something which is really uh, secure for not only the content. So what does it mean in terms of deploying a multi-DRM solution with Dash? Um, it's not only about the device. There is a, a bunch of uh, head and parts that have to be, to be uh, deployed and to work all together. When we speak of, uh, and when we think of uh, DRM, we mostly think about the client in a player and a DRM server. But one has to move more specifically a license server. But it's really important to understand that the license server is just delivering licenses. That's the cryptographic part of uh, this uh, protection. A license server is not going to generate a write. It's just going to write it in a secure way in a license for delivering it to a player where the DRM client is going to enforce it. So there's another server, which is the authorization server, that is defining who's allowed to do what. So the, this means that the integration points there, they are more than just between the client and the license server. You need an integration with the authorization server that is going to provide the right. And this right has to go from this authorization server to the license server for writing down it in the license. Another point of integration is between the DRM server that needs to know the content key, obviously, for having them in the, in the license. So li linking the content key with the right and the packager. So the packager, CMAP dash. So there, we, you have to exchange these keys and also some signalization for every DRM that has to be added in the content. 
And the last uh, type of interface is between this packager, CDN, and so on, to the player with the content that is protected. So this makes, as you can see, a can, quite a lot of uh, integration point between either the client and some server, between server. And for that, there are some uh, standards that exist and can be used. Uh, the first one, uh, so uh, Thomas mentioned at the beginning, is CPIX and SPIKI. So CPIX uh, is a specification defined uh, in Dash IF uh, that allows to, to have in an XML format um, count keys uh, with uh, all the necessary DRM signalization per DRM and any um, information to be added in the content. For example, in case of Dash, you need to add uh, element under content protection element. So this one, there are exchange here. You may need to add information also in your, uh, in your content itself, depending on what you want to do. So everything defined in this CPX XML schema. schema. But you need to exchange it. That's where, that's where Speaky is coming in the loop. Speaky allows to exchange a CPX document between a DRM server and a package. So it's a packager asking for a content key and signalization. There, are, there is an API for that, and the DRM server providing it back. So it, both are working together. The reason for having both is that CPX has been designed, having in mind that you may need to exchange this kind of information not only between a DRM server and a packager. This DRM server packager is kind of similar to create interface, but you, you may have need it somewhere else. So we want it to be generic and created a document where you have the keys and you just need them to, to, um, to exchange over an interface. You could uh, even send a CPX document per email because it can be self-protected using uh, public key encryption and other options. The other interface, so it's between the packager and, the applica and uh, an application. So there, it's really how the content is packaged. So I, as I mentioned, there is uh, the encryption itself. So you need to, to define how, which one it is. So going from for one in now, but there are some signaling content itself. So this is needed uh, so that the application knows uh, what content it is, uh, how it is encrypted, which DRM, Um, which uh, DRM uh, to be used uh, f can be used for uh, decrypting and accessing the keys. So that's really an integration point which is uh, often important. And the last uh, point, uh, so for that, sorry, uh, we have defined in Dash IF uh, some, uh, some constraint on content on what you can put, where you can put it, and so on, based on uh, Dash uh, specification and MDEC. And on CMAF, so we have to align all, everything here, and we're working on this one also with CTOF. The last one, so between the application, the DRM server, and also the authorization server, is about acquiring licenses for getting the content key and the authorization right. So there, there are two elements to consider. It's uh, free proprietary most of the time because the license server is per DRM, the DRM client is per DRM, so you can do whatever you want. And that's the case as of today. The same with the authorization server. Usually the authorization server, it's front end for a CRM or a, another uh, server that the operator has. So there, there's no real way of doing anything that is not uh, as you wish, more or less. But what we see right now is that uh, using tokens for conveying the authorization rights from the authorization server to the DRM server is becoming quite common. So if you have an authorization token and you give it to the player and the player when he's requesting the license to the license server, it just adds this token in the request and the DRM server knows what you have to do. It's just a matter of uh, keeping the content of this authorization server proprietary to a DRM server. And if you look at the player itself where you have the EME, so interface, uh, where you have some kind of some workflows that are already defined and we, if we can extend them 
with some uh, HTTP request and some uh, additional uh, REST API between the application and the license server. Still keeping in mind that there can be some uh, some proprietary aspects there. We could get some, uh, some API that allows to try to convey to do to migrate to something that becomes more usable and where you could uh, define an application that is standard, had a standard default way of working and can work in some cases if the home servers just to take that into account. So that's what we did with the latest version of Dash IS uh, IOP, so version five, uh, where we did a specific, uh, well, specific document on content encryption and uh, all this license acquisition workflow. So it's still in uh, review right now, but uh, you can access it uh, if I, uh, with the link provided by Thomas in his first presentation. So that's just the aspect which is the high level one, so the only at uh, the component level. But now you have for deploying that, there are one more time many different options. So there, are, there is a possibility to deploy on the cloud. You're doing either as a service, you can deploy your own instance, or you can do it yourself on premise. So you take SaaS, you take on do it yourself, public, private cloud, on premises, and you more or less mix uh, everything together and take the combination you want. Not everything is possible, but you can more or less do whatever you want. Keep in mind that uh, the DRM provider, they license their license server more or less uh, to any provide any one vendor willing to integrate it in the in its uh, DRM server. So it's not true for all DRM around the, the world, but the main one you can license them and you can build your own DRM server. This means that right now there is also this uh, other aspect it's that there are many vendors that uh, are providing uh, on SaaS mainly. These services for license servers. So the complexity is here, but uh, with a few uh, specifications, uh, we try to reduce it to something that becomes, uh, in fact, quite simple. And you have uh, all these aspects uh, that can be covered by this, uh, this architecture if you're using authorization token, which becomes the main way of doing it. So using multi-DRM and deploying it, what it brings? Uh, obviously, it brings access to content. As I said in the first slide, DRM is a master for content owner. You, if you want content that has value, you need to have a DRM. Of course, it, that's not the only one. You need uh, other, uh, they have other requirements. Every content owner has its own requirements. They, they put some constraint, uh, additional constraint of some type of uh, content. For example, for UHD content, you need to be careful with the keys you're using. You don't have to mix the keys for UHD with those you use for a lower resolution. So it's, it has an impact typically on dash content. So, but you need a DRM. But another aspect uh, that is uh, really important with DRM, it's uh, most of the time, it's not just restricting access to content. Mm -hmm. The main goal of a DRM is to support the business models of an operator. When you look at uh, the operator, well, when it has content, it has to define how it's going to sell it. Right now, there's a lot of subscription if you're, uh, on, uh, with Dash. That's the easy way for doing that. So more or less, uh, watch all you can, uh, you can, you can, and uh, you get access to the full content. But you can consider that uh, there are additional way of uh, selling this uh, this content and. Uh, the development of live content on OTT, that's going most probably to become needed. And we, we will then need to ensure that the DRM all supports this different business model. For example, the pay-per-view, if you want to do that, so if you want to package some ser live services, or if you have uh, an impulsive pay-per-view to do, how is it going to be implemented in the DRM? This part, uh, this Still some work to be done. So, for example, uh, if you consider the key rotation uh, as it's done in, uh, in a multicast uh, and broadcast world, for mainly for supporting uh, the last minute changes, which uh, can occur quite often with soccer and any sport you can imagine, tennis or anything like that. 
So if you have one key for uh, your day, it's becoming a bit difficult to just uh, define how can you do that. You can do it if you have few events, but it's uh, gymnastic you want to avoid if you have quite a lot of uh, events in the purview. As of today, not all the DRM are supporting this key rotation with this uh, hierarchy with uh, the ECM, EMM uh, that, were, that are used in uh, the conditional access world. So still some limitation on this aspect, but uh, your provider are working on it. Other interesting aspect of uh, the DRM, it's uh, beyond DRM itself. As I said uh, at the beginning, a DRM, the, the main goal is to secure a platform. So if it's secure a platform, you can trust your device and you can use uh, this device and this secure element in the device as a source uh, you can you can trust, and you can do quite some interesting stuff with that that can go beyond simply protecting content. One element, for example, is, uh, as I said, you have an authorization server that is, uh, that is more or less providing the right. So if it's a server that is as important, if not more important, than the, the license server itself. Is this server, anyone can get a token as it wants, well, the, the, the license server is not going to do anything. So you need to secure access to this server. And there the DRM can be used for that. The secure platform you have with your DRM allows you to have a secure, um, a secure identification of your DRM. And when you request this uh, authorization token, you can ensure that only one of your clients can do that and you know which client it is. So that's an additional element that is of interest for the DRM. Another element also, it's a secure streaming control. So there you want to be sure that you have a limited number of uh, clients connecting to your platform. Well, it, can be it can be part of your business model. For example, you want to, to limit the number of people watching. It's used quite often. And then in this case, you can use your DRM to secure that and being sure it's going to be the case. So in conclusion, uh, Dash and MetiDRM, it's, uh, re it's going to help for live OTT to have them closer to broadcast model, but there's still some work. And the multi-DRM is really part of an end-to-end -end solution. You need, in addition to that, uh, uh, other elements such as monitoring and watermarking. And the main use case that we see now with that is to go with live spot, where the, there will be, well, when spot is back, when there will be additional element to product on OTT. Thank you. Super, if you want. Thank you, Laurent. Uh, excellent. Uh, uh, very good presentation. So we still have a few uh, minutes uh, and so we have time for some questions. And um, let's see. Uh, I think that my, it's my video. Oh. I don't know how to turn it on. Sorry. Okay, let's go to the questions. Uh, so we have a couple in the Q&A. So the first one is from uh, John van der Waal, uh, and this is to Will. To get lower latency, more IDR data is sent. What is the increase in bandwidth to do so, Will? So, hey, John, thanks for asking. First, your, your first part of your statement is not correct, though. You don't have to send more IDR data to get lower latency. Do you remember I, I showed you that six second segment? It had one IDR at the start. The chunked version of it still had one IDR at the, at the start. So there was no increase in size due to additional IDRs. Now, if you actually want to do adaptive bitrate switching, you shouldn't use six second segments. You want to go to shorter segments. In that case, you will have an IDR, say, every two seconds, and your, late, your overall latency might be one and a half seconds. So you, you would then, but the, the segment size for non-chunked versus chunked is not gonna grow for IDRs. It is going to grow for another reason though, and that is the increased number of move atoms that you have inside your segment. And I, I actually have, can I share my screen here? I have a, a chart to show the data. Uh, I, I think that works, if you try. Yeah. Uh, here, here. So I made, yes. this, made a, I made this table quickly for you. This is not true, I had it before. This shows the effect of what's the overhead for, for chunking versus non-chunking caused not by IDRs, but by the additional uh, MOOF index. So the dark green is audio files. 
So we have a pretty much a fixed overhead of about 14 to 40 kilobits per second um, for our content. So for audio files, that's a significant increase, a 40% increase in your audio file size, but it's, it's in the order of 40 kilobits per second. The overhead remains pretty constant though for video. So if you look at an ABC video uh, stream at a megabit, 30 frames per second, this only corresponds to a 2.7 increase in bitrate. And as our bitrate, in, sorry, in, in overall uh, segment size, as our bitrate gets higher, um, so the bitrate will, the ratio will get smaller. This one went up here because I'm showing 60 frames per second. So even at 60 frames per second at a, a relatively low bitrate, I've got a 3.6% increase in segments. So that's the sort of maximum penalty you're going to pay uh, for using Chunkly. Thanks, Will. I go on in the questions. We have one from Remo Fogel. I'd love to hear some sentences. Sorry, and this is directed to Thomas. I'd love to hear some sentences about media timed events from W3C. What is the motivation? Can you say something about the use cases and foreseeable implementations? Thomas. Yes, uh, that's actually, it's, 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 it's well, a good question because it points to what we just started. We just started a, a joint work with W3C um, and in Dash, as well as in CMF, you get in-band events, which you can send uh, synchronized uh, to media timing. For example, to do um, overlays, uh, stock tickers, uh, things you do in sports where you have an overlay for graphics and so on. So it's application thing, but it's synchronized to media. So the question is now, if you add this to an HTML5 uh, based platform, how do you basically integrate this uh, media events uh, with the uh, HTML5 APIs. And an obvious one is the usage of uh, data queues, uh, but we need to find basically the proper um, API interfaces to map these um, send media events uh, to the HTML5 uh, functionalities. Uh, and it goes beyond these things. I mean, we also using these events for issues like add insertion, splicing and so on. So it's basically where to intercept these events and how to map them and then onto the, the endpoints. And W3C is this uh, reference platform. So that's why we started this joint work. And so W3C experts have joined us in this, this task force. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And uh, just an announcement here that all the presentations and slides are available on the website, dvborg.webinars. We will continue a few more minutes to answer all questions though. Uh, so now next we will have a couple of questions to Zachary. I will take them one at a time. Zachary, uh, from John Devos, can the ad insertion capabilities be used both for video and audio only radio workflows? And second question, is there any cooperation with Apple to ensure ad insertion workflows work in HLS as well? Yeah, both great questions. Um, so for the first one, these workflows are definitely not um, required to be a specific form of video and audio. Uh, we're, we're we, the requirements we're placing are on the idea that you're using a CMAP presentation, which can be video only, it can be audio only, it can be video and audio, uh, text and events. And really, we're trying to make sure any workflow you want to enable with uh, media assets, you can via this uh, ad insertion capability. Um, and to the question on cooperation with Apple, uh, the the work that we're doing in Dash IF is, um, the, uh, again, on the, the basics of the workflow and the work that we're doing is actually, um, it's in parallel with uh, some work on the CTA Wave side, which is addressing the uh, cooperation as, and interoperability aspects between Dash and HLS. And so there's, a, there's an active communication and involvement between the two groups um, where uh, CTA Wave is focusing much more on the aspect of ensuring holistic interoperability, but we will make sure um, as much as possible that what we specify is compatible across uh, both formats. Thank you, Zachary. We have one more question for you. This is from Bill Redman. So do content and ads have to have the same video properties, e.g. SDR versus HDR, uh, or can they be freely mixed? That's a great question, Bill. And uh, it, a lot of that comes down to um, the conditioning and, uh, and capabilities of the platform. And we've actually outlined in the, um, the CR specific references on the CTA wave side where they've talked a lot more in depth 
around the compatibility with um, device platforms and their ability to switch codecs, their ability to switch frame rates, resolutions, aspect ratios, what you can expect and the kind of conformance and compliance that you'll get. Um, we've deferred a, we've deferred to the CTA wave to pieces there to avoid um, redefinition, um, but it uh, it will quite practically um, depend on how well um, or how what type of devices you're act, you're utilizing in your ecosystem. Thanks, Zachary. Uh, next is also a question for you. This is from Peter Sherman. It's rather detailed and technical, so I will just try to read it out loud. Uh, so how does the time synchronization take place? From the source, there will be an incoming PCR, which is converted to time-based solution after transcoder slash packager. So from that point, the PTS is lost. In SCTE segmentation descriptors, the PTS is the reference for the actual slice point. How do you extract the PTS from the original stream carrying SCTE 35 time signal? I see a presentation time in the manifest. How was it created? Ah, yeah, that is a, that's a, that's a good technical question. So um, the one of the aspects I, I did not explicitly call out is that the actual um, interface between the encoder and the packager is, is um, one of the possibilities of that implementation is uh, another uh, interoperability point that the Dash IF has worked on, which is the live media ingest uh, specification. Um, and as part of that, there is the expectation that the encoder uh, is uh, properly taking this, the segmented uh, information and uh, persisting in that, that, that presentation time um, and synchronization point through the output. So the, uh, as, part of the present, uh, as part of presenting the uh, encoded segments to the packager, the, uh, the interface is, a, uh, is providing CMAF encoded content where the uh, mechanisms the mechanism for carrying both the segmentation information and the media data has uh, a common uh, time presenta presentation time. Uh, so then later on, as the packager and the MPD manipulator are um, uh, accessing that presentation time, they're referencing the same uh, clock within the CMAF presentation. Thank you, Zachary. You are very popular. We have one more question for you. This one is from Mel Boutin. What is the purpose of the IF7 interface between the video player and the manifest manipulator? You briefly talked about it, but do you need a dedicated video player to make the solution work? Uh, this is one of my favorite questions. So uh, there's actually, there's kind of, there's what I'd like to term three types of ad insertion. There's client side ad insertion, which is where you typically have the multiplayer solution and it's much more up to the client application to switch you know, go fetch an advertisement external to the, to the mainstream and switch the, 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 the players out. Um, then there's server-side ad insertion, which we talked about. Uh, but then there's the server-guided ad insertion, which I, over, um, which I closely alluded to as uh, another format that we're looking at. And with the, the goal of server-guided ad insertion is to keep a single player as the source of truth for the entire stream. And instead of providing all of the ad opportunities up front, allow those ad opportunities to be late bound um, via resolution that's done at, as part of the play out mechanism. Um, and this would, the overall goals uh, of this is what IF7 is trying to capture, that they will have a communication back to a proxy or another service that allows, that will provide the appropriate opportunity as the client needs it. And this allows you to um, only provide ad insertion opportunities or ad insertion decisions uh, when clients will play them, so you're not wasting your inventory. And it also allows you to provide independent scale of your content ad services, um, something that server side ad insertion uh, does not directly let you do today. Thank you, Zachary. Very good answers. And uh, this was the last question in the Q&A. So I will hand back over to Owen at DVB. Thank you, Per, and I want to say thank you to all of our presenters this afternoon, to Ali, to Jean-Baptiste, to Laurent, Thomas, uh, to Will, to Zachary, uh, also to you, Per, for uh, this excellent job in moderating this afternoon's um, webinar. And also, uh, really, thank you to the Dash Industry Forum. Uh, we do work very closely with uh, the Dash Industry Forum um, 
within DVB and so uh, it's really good to be able to offer this uh, this webinar and to be able to um, cooperate in this way. Uh, the slides, as you said, Per, are available now at dvb.org slash webinars and the video of this webinar will be available a little bit later this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Owen. I'm leaving now. Cheers. <laughs>